interactions of skeletal muscles, their fascicle arrangement, and their lever systems. To move the skeleton, the tension created by the contraction of the fibers in most skeletal muscles is transferred to the tendons. The tendons are strong bands of dense, regular connective tissue that connect muscles to bones. The bone connection is why this muscle tissue is called skeletal muscle. Interactions of skeletal muscles in the body. To pull on a bone. That is, to change the angle at its synovial joint, which essentially moves the skeleton. A skeletal muscle must also be attached to a fixed part of the skeleton. The movable end of the muscle that attaches to the bone being pulled is called the muscles. Insertion and the end of the muscle attached to a fixed, stabilized, bone is called the, origin. During forearm, flexion, bending the elbow, the brachioradialis assists the brachialis. Although a number of muscles may be involved in an action, the principal muscle involved is called the, prime mover, or, agonist. To lift a cup, a muscle called the biceps brachii is actually the prime mover. However, because it can be assisted by the brachialis. The brachialis is called a synergist in this action. Figure 1. A synergist can also be a fixator that stabilizes the bone that is the attachment for the prime mover's origin. A muscle with the opposite action of the prime mover is called an antagonist. Antagonists play two important roles in muscle function. 1. They maintain body or limb position such as holding the arm out or standing erect. And, 2. They control rapid movement, as in shadow boxing without landing a punch or the ability to check the motion of a limb. For example, to extend the knee, a group of four muscles called the quadriceps femoris in the anterior compartment of the thigh are activated, and would be called the agonists of knee extension. However, to flex the knee joint, an opposite or antagonistic set of muscles called the hamstrings is activated. As you can see, these terms would also be reversed for the opposing action. If you consider the first action as the knee bending, the hamstrings would be called the agonists and the quadriceps femoris would then be called the antagonists. See Table 1 for a list of some agonists and antagonists. There are also skeletal muscles that do not pull against the skeleton for movements. For example, there are the muscles that produce facial expressions. The insertions and origins of facial muscles are in the skin, so that certain individual muscles contract to form a smile or frown, form sounds or words, and raise the eyebrows. There also are skeletal muscles in the tongue and the external urinary and anal sphincters that allow for voluntary regulation of urination and defecation, respectively. In addition, the diaphragm contracts and relaxes to change the volume of the pleural cavities but it does not move the skeleton to do this. Everyday connections. Exercise and stretching. When exercising, it is important to first warm up the muscles. Stretching pulls on the muscle fibers and it also results in an increased blood flow to the muscles. Being worked without a proper warm-up, it is possible that you may either damage some of the muscle fibers or pull a tendon. A pulled tendon, regardless of location, results in pain, swelling, and diminished function. If it is moderate to severe, the injury could immobilize you for an extended period. Recall the discussion about muscles crossing joints to create movement. Most of the joints you use during exercise are synovial joints, which have synovial fluid in the joint space between two bones. Exercise and stretching may also have a beneficial effect on synovial joints. Synovial fluid is a thin, but viscous film with the consistency of egg whites. When you first get up and start moving, your joints feel stiff for a number of reasons. After proper stretching and warm-up, the synovial fluid may become less viscous, allowing for better joint function. Patterns of fascicle organization. Skeletal muscle is enclosed in connective tissue scaffolding at three levels. Each muscle fiber 
cell is covered by endomysium and the entire muscle is covered by epimysium. When a group of muscle fibers is bundled as a unit within the whole muscle by an additional covering of a connective tissue called perimysium, that bundled group of muscle fibers is called a fascicle. Fascicle arrangement by paramecia is correlated to the force generated by a muscle. It also affects the range of motion of the muscle. Based on the patterns of fascicle arrangement, skeletal muscles can be classified in several ways. What follows are the most common fascicle arrangements. Parallel muscles have fascicles that are arranged in the same direction as the long axis of the muscle. Figure 2. The majority of skeletal muscles in the body have this type of organization. Some parallel muscles are flat sheets that expand at the ends to make broad attachments. Other parallel muscles are rotund with tendons at one or both ends. Muscles that seem to be plump have a large mass of tissue located in the middle of the muscle. Between the insertion and the origin, which is known as the central body, a more common name for this muscle is belly. When a muscle contracts, the contractile fibers shorten it to an even larger bulge. For example, extend and then flex your biceps brachii muscle. The large middle section is the belly. Figure 3. When a parallel muscle has a central large belly that is spindle-shaped, meaning it tapers as it extends to its origin and insertion, it sometimes is called fusiform. Circular muscles are also called sphincters. See figure 2. When they relax, the sphincters concentrically arranged bundles of muscle fibers increase the size of the opening. And when they contract, the size of the opening shrinks to the point of closure. The orbicularis oris muscle is a circular muscle that goes around the mouth. When it contracts, the oral opening becomes smaller as when puckering the lips for whistling. Another example is the orbicularis oculi, one of which surrounds each eye. Consider, for example, the names of the two orbicularis muscles, orbicularis oris and orbicularis oculi, where part of the first name of both muscles is the same. The first part of orbicularis, orb, orb equals, circular is a reference to a round or circular structure. It may also make one think of orbit, such as the moon's path around the earth. The word oris, oris equals, oral, refers to the oral cavity, or the mouth. The word oculi, ocular equals, eye, refers to the eye. There are other muscles throughout the body named by their shape or location. The deltoid is a large, triangular shaped muscle that covers the shoulder. It is so named because the Greek letter delta looks like a triangle. The rectus abdominis, rector equals straight, is the straight muscle in the anterior wall of the abdomen, while the rectus femoris is the straight muscle in the anterior compartment of the thigh. When a muscle has a widespread expansion over a sizable area, but then the fascicles come to a single common attachment point. The muscle is called, convergent. The attachment point for a convergent muscle could be a tendon, an aponeurosis, a flat, broad tendon, or a raphe, a very slender tendon. The large muscle on the chest, the pectoralis major, is an example of a convergent muscle because it converges on the greater tubercle of the humerus. Via a tendon, the temporalis muscle of the cranium is another. Pennate, muscles. Penna equals, feathers. Blend into a tendon that runs through the central region of the muscle for its whole length. Somewhat like the quill of a feather with the muscle arranged similar to the feathers. Due to this design, the muscle fibers in a pennate muscle can only pull at an angle. And as a result, Contracting pennate muscles do not move their tendons very far. However, because a pennate muscle generally can hold more muscle fibers within it, it can produce relatively more tension for its size. There are three subtypes of pennate muscles. In a unipennate muscle, the fascicles are located on one side of the tendon. 
The extensor digitorum of the forearm is an example of a unipennate muscle. A bipennate muscle has fascicles on both sides of the tendon. In some pennate muscles, the muscle fibers wrap around the tendon, sometimes forming individual fascicles in the process. This arrangement is referred to as multipennate. A common example is the deltoid muscle of the shoulder, which covers the shoulder but has a single tendon that inserts on the deltoid tuberosity of the humerus. Because of fascicles, a portion of a multipennate muscle like the deltoid can be stimulated by the nervous system to change the direction of the pole. For example, when the deltoid muscle contracts, the arm abducts, moves away from midline in the sagittal plane. But when only the anterior fascicle is stimulated, the arm will abduct and flex, move anteriorly at the shoulder joint. The lever system of muscle and bone interactions. Skeletal muscles do not work by themselves. Muscles are arranged in pairs based on their functions. For muscles attached to the bones of the skeleton, the connection determines the force, speed, and range of movement. These characteristics depend on each other and can explain the general organization of the muscular and skeletal systems. The skeleton and muscles act together to move the body. Have you ever used the back of a hammer to remove a nail from wood? The handle acts as a lever and the head of the hammer acts as a fulcrum. The fixed point that the force is applied to when you pull back or push down on the handle. The effort applied to this system is the pulling or pushing on the handle to remove the nail. Which is the load? or resistance to the movement of the handle in the system. Our musculoskeletal system works in a similar manner, with bones being stiff levers and the articular endings of the bones, encased in synovial joints, acting as fulcrums. The load would be an object being lifted or any resistance to a movement. Your head is a load when you are lifting it, and the effort, or applied force, comes from contracting skeletal muscle. Chapter Review Skeletal muscles each have an origin and an insertion. The end of the muscle that attaches to the bone being pulled is called the muscle's insertion end. The end of the muscle attached to a fixed or stabilized bone is called the origin. The muscle primarily responsible for a movement is called the prime mover. And muscles that assist in this action are called synergists. A synergist that makes the insertion site more stable is called a fixator. Meanwhile, a muscle with the opposite action of the prime mover is called an antagonist. Several factors contribute to the force generated by a skeletal muscle. One is the arrangement of the fascicles in the skeletal muscle. Fascicles can be parallel, circular, convergent, pennate, fusiform, or triangular. Each arrangement has its own range of motion and ability to do work. Make sure to smash the like and subscribe buttons to receive notifications all new contents.